Perfect. Okay. Um, is everybody ready to start our training session? Sure. Yes. 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 Okay. Great. All right. First, I want to thank Amanda for um, for getting this all figured out to allow me to re appear remotely, so I don't have to spread my flu germs to everybody. <laughs> so um, tonight, what we have scheduled for our training session is um, a presentation about Secra. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen because I have a little PowerPoint presentation available here. And let's see if I can get this onto presentation mode. Can you see my screen? There we go. Okay. All right. So this is something that we talk about at almost every meeting. Um, the State Environmental Quality Review Act, or CRA, for short. Um, I'll be going through just you know where it all came from, what the purpose of CRA is, and I've broken down the whole CRA process into seven steps that we'll be going through tonight. Um, with the 25 or so minutes that we have available. <laughs> it's a lot to cover. Um, so I'm gonna start buying through this. Um, there we go. All right, so what is CECRA? It started in 1975. Um, in 1975, the New York State Legislature adopted Article 8 of the New York State Environmental Conservation Law, which has now become known as CECRA. Um, a year later, the New York State DEC, the Department of Environmental Conservation, adopted the regulations that implement CECRA, and that's at 6 NYCRR Part 617. Those are the regulations um, that govern our uh, CECRA review uh, for, for each project that we review that's subject to CECRA. Um, if you look at the Department of Environmental Conservation's website, if you just Google CECRA um, and you click on the DEC website that comes up, it is a literal treasure trove of information related to CECRA. If you're a CECRA nerd or geek like I am, <laughs> it's, I mean, you could spend hours reviewing all of the information they have. They have flowcharts, there's a CECRA handbook that goes through sort of a question and answer style um, um, uh, you know, method for going through the CECRA process um, and explaining what each step means. It's, it's a really useful website and has a lot of good tools, so I encourage you to look there. Um, but basically what CECRA does is it requ it's a requirement for all state and local agencies to assess the environmental effects of a, of a discretionary action, so an action that you have discretion to approve or deny, um, before you decide to approve that action. Um, that is, unless the action is exempt from CECRA, which we'll talk about um, in a moment. Um, so the purpose of CECRA is really to identify and consider environmental impacts of an action um, to determine whether those actions have to be modified um, to avoid or mitigate adverse environmental impacts. So it really is, it's a process that results most times in a, in a better project um, than, than what's initially proposed through this process of modifying it to avoid or mitigate adverse environmental impacts. Um, it's not the intent of CECRA that every single environmental factor um, is, the, is the sole consideration um, in reviewing the action. Instead, CECRA requires that environmental factors be balanced with social and economic considerations as well. Um, the New York State Court of Appeals, the highest court in the state, has also said that the agency, and I'll quote here, need not investigate every conceivable environmental problem. It may, within reasonable limits, use its discretion in selecting which ones are relevant. So it's really meant to be, and you'll see this in the secret regulations if you read through them, this rule of reason, quote unquote, rule of reason, um, has been applied in the CEQA regulations and in the courts um, to the CEQA process. Um, so how do we comply with CEQA? Well, there's two ways um, that, there's two things that you're gonna wanna look at when you're 
considering compliance with CICRA, one procedural and the second substantive. Procedural is, is really just making sure you are strictly complying with each of the required steps in CICRA. Um, an example of this is, um, and I, you know, I'm sure most of us are familiar with the fact that there are, there's this thing called the environmental assessment form, which all applicants submit with their applications. Well, there's a short version and a full version. Um, the CEQA regulations require that when you have a type one action, so those are the actions that are more likely to, to result in a significant adverse impact, um, you are required to use the full environmental assessment form. You can't use the short for a type one action. If a short environmental assessment form is used for a type one action, then you have not strictly complied with CEQA, um, their, the procedural requirements, and that determination can be overturned by the court if challenged. So that's an example of strict compliance with the procedures. Um, substantive compliance um, is a little bit more, <laughs> harder to define, I'll say. Um, and what substantive compliance refers to is that if your secret determination is challenged, courts are gonna look at whether the board took a quote unquote hard look at the relevant environmental impacts and whether you made a reasoned elaboration for your determination. So there's a lot to unpack in that, in that statement. Um, part, so the relevant environmental concerns, those you have discretion to look at an application to determine what are the relevant environmental issues that we need to study here. You may have an application that does involve an impact to a wetland, but perhaps it's a negligible, negligible impact and it's not really of concern, but maybe that, that application does pose um, you know, larger traffic issues or um, uh, um, you know, lighting issues. Those are the, the relevant environmental impacts that you're going to be studying, not necessarily the negligible wetland impact. Um, so what does it mean to take a hard look? Well, this goes to how, how closely did you investigate that particular impact? Um, did you review an expert study? Not that an expert study has to be submitted for every application, but that certainly helps to demonstrate the, the board's hard look at the impact. Um, you know, did the board ask questions of the applicant? Did the board ask questions of its consultants? Um, you know, how, how, how deep did you really dig in to that, that issue? That's what the courts are going to be looking at. And then your reasoned elaboration, that's what we do every time that we, we prepare a secret negative declaration for a project. Um, that, you know, multiple page document that's attached to the part three of the EAF is your reasoned elaboration. That's where we go through each of those relevant environmental impacts that have been identified for the application. And we explain, here's why, you know, there were project modifications made that mitigated, um, you know, mitigated traffic impacts or mitigated um, stormwater impacts. These are, this is how the project was modified. And this is the information that the board has relied upon in its review to determine that there's no significant environmental impact that's going to result from the project. That is your reasoned elaboration. Um, now, this all go, all of this um, goes to the importance of creating a good record um, for your review of an application. A record consists of everything that's before the board at the time it makes its decision. So that could include all the information from the applicant, all public comments, whether in writing or verbal at a, at a public hearing, um, memos from your consultants, um, memos from staff, for example, your, your building inspector, um, testimony at public meetings, all of that is packaged up into this thing called the record. And when a court is reviewing your um, determination when challenged, that's the only thing the court is going to be permitted to, to look at. Um, it cannot review information that's outside of that record. So that's why it's so important to make sure that your decision is documented, that you have um, you know, what we call a rational basis in the record, that you can point to information, data, evidence in the record that supports your decision. Because that's what the board is going to, that's what, I'm sorry, that's what the court is going to be looking at. In looking at that information, um, 
the courts do treat expert opinion differently from my opinion. I think we, we touched upon this at the last meeting as well, our last training session. Um, and a lot of times this comes up most often when you're talking about traffic. Um, and you, you can have a professional traffic engineer submit a traffic impact study that demonstrates that based on all of the IT standards and all of the, the data and studies that, that, that have been applied um, to the project that for example, a particular intersection is not going to have a decline in its level of service. So it's not gonna have a significant adverse impact on that particular intersection. However, you could have a member of the public come up and say, well, wait a minute, that, that doesn't make sense based on my experience at that intersection at three o'clock or four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so the best way for the board at, in that instance to really demonstrate the hard look is to use that information from the member of the public to ask the applicant's consultant and ask the board's consultants, hey, wait a minute, was this information that the, the, the member of the public just brought up reviewed as part of this traffic impact study? What, what is your response to that? Um, but at the end of the day, the court is going to say that the board is bound to, um, to sort of listen to or rely upon the expert opinion over the lay opinion. And this is a, a very frustrating thing for, for many boards um, that, that I represent um, throughout the region. It's, um, but it, it's, it's a fact that, that that's how the courts are going to look at that evidence. Um, so moving on to the basic framework, because I know our, our time is starting to, to lean in. Um, we're gonna go through seven basic steps to the CEQA process. So when an application is first submitted, the first thing we're gonna do is we classify the action. So we look at the environmental assessment form, we look at the um, what's being proposed, and we determine is it type one, type two, or unlisted. Usually this is done at the staff level. This is not usually something that, that the board is really charged with, with reviewing. Um, type one actions, and there's literally a list of these actions in the secret regulations, are those that um, DEC has specifically identified as being more likely than not to result in a significant adverse environmental impact requiring the preparation of an environmental impact statement. Type two, again, there's another list within the secret regulations of type two actions and those are the ones that DEC has categorically said, no matter where the project is located, whether it's in you know, Westchester County, Dutchess County, Clinton County, wherever it is, these particular projects will not result in a significant adverse environmental impact. So for example, the construction of a single family home is a type two action. So no matter where a single family home is constructed, that's not the kind of thing that is going to trigger the preparation of an environmental impact statement. Unlisted actions are literally just that. They're not in the type one list, they're not in the type two list, they are unlisted. And there's no presumption that's carried with an unlisted action that it will or will not result in a significant adverse environmental impact. So once we classify our action, the next step is to figure out, okay, well, who's gonna be responsible for reviewing the environmental impacts of this project. And that's the, the lead agency. So when you have a type one action, you are required to designate a lead agency for unlisted. Um, you can do an uncoordinated review, which basically means that every agency that has any kind of approval authority over the project does their own secret review of the whole project, not just the area within their jurisdiction, but the whole project. So usually we coordinate and choose a lead agency. And that's what we do at the beginning of, of each project where the board makes a motion to authorize circulation of notice of intent. So what the board is saying is that, you know, we as planning board of the city of Beacon, we wanna be the lead agency to review the environmental impacts of this project, but we need to notify all of the other potential lead agencies. So all of the other, um, boards and agencies both within Beacon and outside of Beacon um, that has authority over the project. So that could be DOT, DEC, you know, Dutchess County Department of Health, et cetera. 
And we circulate notice to each of those agencies that, hey, if we're raising our hand, we want to be lead agency. And you have 30 days to tell us that, that you object and that you would rather be lead agency. Uh, once those 30 days has passed, uh, the planning board can become the lead agent. Um, step three, determining significance. This is probably the most important step of, of the seeker review. This is when you issue your negative declaration or positive declaration. And the question you're asking yourselves is, will the application result in one or more significant adverse environmental impacts? The answer is no. If there are no significant adverse environmental impacts, you issue your negative declaration. If the answer is it may, there may be one or more significant impacts. That's when a positive declaration is triggered, which we'll talk about on the next slide, starts a whole other set of steps. <laughs> um, now, I think it's important, a couple of things about negative declarations. Um, many times an application um, is modified during the course of the board's review, such that perhaps when it first came in, there, there may be one or more significant adverse impacts that could be identified, but the applicant voluntarily modifies the project or the quote unquote proposed action such that there no longer is a significant adverse environmental impact. So for example, a project could have, you know, reduction in density or, um, you know, uh, somehow reduced in size um, that could result in a negative declaration instead of a positive declaration. That's more often than not, that's what we see, that there are project modifications that occur during the course of the application review that allows for the negative declaration. Um, one kind of interesting point about the timing for a negative declaration, which I always find interesting, um, is the CEQA regs do have a time frame set forth uh, for when a neg deck should be issued, and that's 20 days after establishing lead agency. So if you think about it, you establish lead agency right at the beginning of the, of the project. So 20 days after that is, is not, you know, not a lot of time <laughs> to review. But the alternative is, or um, when the lead agency receives all information it may reasonably need to make the determination of significance. So um, that's more often than not the triggering mechanism that, that boards use, 20 days after it's received all the information it needs to make its determination. And there was a course, um, a, course a, cor uh, a case from 2005 that came out of the town of Marlboro where the planning board took 853 days to issue a neg deck. Um, the, and the court said, that's fine. You didn't violate CICRA. The court said, and I'll quote, in our view, the planning board as the lead agency painstakingly undertook to gather substantial data regarding the application, holding both public meetings and hearings in order to receive and consider evidence from all interested parties. Following the expiration of the deadline for submissions, the board issued the night deck at its next regularly scheduled meeting. Thus, we conclude the determination was not untimely. So I always find that interesting, 853 days. I think that has to be a record. Um, so with that, moving on to our next step. So if the board determines that there may be one or more um, significant adverse environmental impacts, it issues a positive declaration, which then triggers a requirement for preparing a draft environmental impact statement. Um, typically that's prepared by the applicant um, and, and their representatives. Um, prior to preparing that DEIS or draft environmental impact statement, um, you have to go through a scoping process. Scoping used to be voluntary, used to be optional before the 2019 secret amendments, now it's required. And basically what scoping is, is it's the process of creating a written document that outlines all of the issues that are gonna be studied in the environmental impact statement. Um, the purpose is really to narrow the scope of the issues that are gonna be studied um, so you don't waste time you know focusing on issues that are not necessarily relevant or you know haven't been identified as significant um, it's really supposed to focus only on those 
issues that are potentially significant and eliminate consideration of impacts that are Ill irrelevant or insignificant. Um, so there's a whole process for scoping. Typically the applicant will submit a draft scope for review. The lead agency then circulates that scope to all of the other agencies with approval authority called involved agencies, um, solicits public comment. Um, sometimes there, many times there are changes made to the scoping outline. Sometimes there's a public hearing process, um, but there should at least be some math method of, of written public comment um, available. And then if the lead agency has not approved um, a, a final scoping document within 60 days after the applicant has submitted the draft scope, then the draft becomes the final. Um, so that's important that um, the lead agency act swiftly um, to make sure that any revisions that need to be made can be made. That period can be extended on mutual consent, um, but it's still important to get through that process um, swiftly. So the next step, once you have your scoping outline, which is essentially you know, the table of contents for, for the impact statement, the applicant prepares the DEIS. Um, so that's gonna examine the nature and the extent of all the potentially significant adverse environmental impacts. Um, the sort of the cornerstone of an EIS is really the consideration of alternatives. There's a section of the EIS where um, a number of you know, alternatives to the proposed action need to be considered. One of those that has to be considered is the no action alternative. So what, what would be the impacts if nothing happened, if this project just didn't exist? Um, and typically there's like a, a you know, reduced size alternative, reduced density, et cetera. Um, so there's a process by which after the applicant submits the, a draft environmental impact statement, the, um, the lead agency and its consultants will review that to determine whether it's complete. And in determining whether it's complete, you will check and see was, was each of the items identified in the scoping outline, um, you know, studied and vetted um, to, the, uh, to the boards, to the lead agency's satisfaction. Um, if it's complete, then the lead agency will deem it complete and schedule a public hearing on that draft environmental impact statement. After the public hearing, the next step is the preparation of the final environmental impact statement. Now, what's unique about the final environmental impact statement is that it will respond in writing to every question raised during the public hearing on the DEIS, whether that's you know testimony from the public at a public hearing, written comments from outside agencies, every single one of those comments and questions are responded to in writing. Many times this process does result in some project modifications, um, which are also analyzed in the FEIS. And then as we have about two minutes left here, <laughs> um, the last step in the secret process is um, preparation of a finding statement. Um, the finding statement basically um, is the culmination of your environmental review. It provides a rationale for your decision and certifies that the alternative that is selected, whether it's the initial proposed action or one of the alternatives, is the action that avoids or minimizes the adverse environmental impacts to the maximum extent practicable. Um, so, it's really like it's a it's a balancing measure when you're when you're preparing a finding statement and you're reviewing all of the information in your record uh, for your environmental review. You're looking at um, all of the, the the impacts of each of the alternatives, and you're determining which alternative um, you know really mitigates the environmental impacts to the maximum extent practical, while also keeping in mind you know social and economic considerations as well. Um, so that is your last step in the uh, CEQA process. Um, I would ask for, for questions, but I know we're short on time, um, but I'm sure that we can, you know, follow up perhaps in January or in February and, um, and have a presentation on CEQA again, because I know that this is something that's obviously relevant to, to almost every application that the planning board reviews, um, and it's always helpful to 
to you know, fully understand the process. Thanks, Jennifer. Appreciate it.